Good evening. At Hyde Park tonight, we feature the Minister of Higher Education and Cultural Affairs, Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksa. Good evening and a warm welcome to our discussion tonight. Good evening. Um, I think um, as the discussion goes as usual every week, I'd like to start off with your career. Long history starting uh, political active politics in 1976, if I'm not mistaken, and you enter politics uh, in the sense parliament uh, become a member of parliament in year 2004 and uh, shortly after you turned down a ministerial position and then in 2006 uh, you resign and um, let's let's uh, look back revisit at your uh, political career it's a long history mm -hmm. if I briefly mention it in fact that when we had our by-election for my constituency mm -hmm. in Girwa Pattu in 1976 uh, which was full vacant uh, as a result of the death of then Minister of uh, Health and Fisheries, okay. uh, late uh, George Rajabaksha. There was a by-election during which period that I really got uh, involved in active politics. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just after my O-level. Uh, soon thereafter, then the general election was conducted in 77. By the time that I was the uh, deputy chairman of the what we call Bala Mandale mm -hmm. and the uh, president of the Samawadi student movement in Ambantura district. Mm -hmm. uh, then of course, uh, soon after that I uh, joined the bank of Ceylon. I was working in the bank. That was so few how long weeks. So were you with the bank? In fact that I few weeks, we were five or six weeks after my A-level results that I was selected for the uh, that appointment in the Bank of Ceylon. Okay. And I worked there for about five and a half years, mm -hmm. during which period I did about either four or five examinations. Mm -hmm. uh, my first in law, LLB, then uh, my master, qualifying master exam, attorney at law. Yes. Uh, in fact, that I was uh, selected to the, in, uh, selected as an internal student, but I resigned from the arts faculty because I had no intention to do arts, I wanted to do law. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then of course, in 1983, I had completed all my examinations within a shortest possible time period. Mm -hmm. Then I, of course, uh, entered into the legal profession. Right. After that, I didn't want to do politics, I was rather fed up. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? <laughs> I thought that's better to concentrate on my profession. Yes. But later on, you know, accidentally it happened that again I, I was compelled to get into politics uh, because uh, in uh, late 1980s, Mrs. Bandar and I had a lot of legal issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were able to incorporate your... Uh, I was retained to appear for her mm -hmm. in some of the cases. With that one, I was very close to Mrs. Bandar and I guess mm -hmm. one of his lawyers. Right. That relationship was continued even after 1994 mm -hmm. uh, when uh, mm -hmm. Chandrika Bandar Nayak Kumar Thunga became the president. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, I was a um, uh, legal consultant and an ad advisor in many matters, right. especially party matters. Mm -hmm. Then I got opportunities to contest elections several times. In fact, in 1989. I was invited by Mrs. Bandar Naik to contest in uh, Mulkiri Gala, mm -hmm. which I didn't want. Even in 2000, uh, Mrs. Chandrika Bandar Naik. Is this because you didn't want to get into politics at that time? I too? thought not worth. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in 2000 also, I was invited to contest for Athanagal electorate. Mrs. Bandar Naik, I refused that. In 2004 also, that I was offered, still I refused. By the time then I was the chairman of the party disciplinary committee of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had held uh, so many public offices also yeah. in media institution also as a director of Pioneer Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, director uh, uh, National Film Corporation, managing director Lake House, yes. <laughs> chairman of the press council and the vice president of the World Association of Press Council I was elected. I held so many positions in 2004 also, although I refused to enter into politics, uh, Mr. Bandar Naik, uh, Kumar Dunga, uh, 
forcefully you know influence me to become a minister and a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. Then finally when she insisted that I should become a minister then I said no. I can become a member of parliament without having any portfolio. So what she offered was the Ministry of uh, Constitutional Affairs. Right. Then Why finally, did you turn that down? I thought that uh, due to several reasons that I thought that I was not self-sufficient to get into policy, politics because I didn't want to uh, depend on others and mm -hmm. become a stooge of the uh, business people or the mm -hmm. other corrupt uh, dealers. I thought if I become self-sufficient one day that I will consider of accepting some portfolio. Somehow finally she agreed. Then I became a member of parliament in May 2014 and I was the only MP without the portfolio uh, until that the presidential election was concluded right. in right. 2005 November. In the prime, then prime, then prime minister Mahindra Rajapaksa became the president. He invited to be a member of his cabinet, I refused. Few weeks, few days later, of course, he was insisting that I should become a minister. Then I accepted the Minister of uh, Banking Affairs, State, State Bank Development. Mm -hmm. uh, after holding that office for, for about six months, I thought that I can't do true to my conscience and I didn't want to uh, surrender my policies. Then I resigned. <laughs> I mean, wh what was it so wrong there for you to not be able to continue your ministerial portfolio? I, I am a believer of democracy and that uh, in the state governance that you know the taking decisions by a powerful uh, few won't help to improve the levels of that the livelihood and the standard of a country. Uh, and also that I was very unhappy about uh, so the level of corruption in that government. But uh, I didn't have a f any fight with anybody. I didn't want. Mm -hmm. I quite gracefully uh, retired from the <laughs> portfolio. Then of course that uh, the president uh, being a long associated very close uh, friend from my same village area, he invited me to become the chairman of the COP. Mm -hmm. That led to so many confrontations <laughs> with my COP reports that I attended one COP report on 12th of January 2007, uh, in which that I disclosed corruption tuning up to over 300 billion mm -hmm. in a country where that in our annual revenue, government annual revenue was below 1,000 billion. Of course, that as a result of my uh, exposure of that uh, corruption, uh, there were some groups in then opposition that who joined, the, who crossed over to the government side, about 18 M MPs. Right. And all became ministers or deputy ministers. Then I was rather critical of that move? On the, yes, because I had to say that those who should have been in the prison have gone to the president's house and becoming the ministers, I won't tolerate. With that one that I had to go for a lot of confrontations. Right. But that is in a most uh, democratic way. <laughs> but you were, you were certainly not uh, happy with uh, what yes. was going on at the time. And yeah. then uh, you somehow, um, you then accept I an invitation. Over. Yes. Then I cross over to the opposition, not to the opposi opposition political party. Then I remain uh, independent since November 2007 mm -hmm. till the parliament was dissolved. I expected that uh, SLP leader Mahindra Rajapaksa would take some action against me to expel me, but he did not do that role. So, <laughs> then I continued during that uh, tenure of the parliament. Then of course, when it came to 2010 crucial election, mm -hmm. My idea was to really to retire uh, from the politics. But I was insisted by the opposition leader, the present, my party leader, that you should remain in politics, that he said he will allocate that uh, first slot from the nationalists. 
uh, finally I agreed on one condition that I do not want to come to the parliament or national list anymore. I will contest if people reject that I will be the happiest. If people elect me, I will serve the people further. That okay. is how in 2010 I contested for Kalambu district representing basically being the organizer of uh, Maharagama. Mm -hmm. Then of course in 2015 also that I contested and the people elected me. So you are you're, you're taking your political career forward uh, as, as the people have voted you in. But you that said… That depends on because that is I, I won't take a decision about my political career so long as people elect me. Uh, I will continue to serve them. The day that they will reject me that I will be still I will have happiest and I have no uh, uh, qualm or regrets. You said a question you asked yourself was <coughs> whether it is worth it to get into politics, but uh, with the recent developments, uh, do you still ask yourself whether it is worth it? Have you been able to really look back and think um, about if it? You, if you look at from my, you know, that is the, the as a professional, from my angle, uh, it is a loss and not worth. But still, you know, you will have to wait uh, uh, as to whether that is with the opportunities that I have that I can have a comfortable life, I can have more earnings through my profession. On the other hand, now whether uh, when there is opportunity to, to do something for the people, to serve the people, uh, should I give up that opportunity? Uh, then of course, uh, I finally decided I will serve for some time that uh, I have no any target whether it is 5 years, 10 years or like that. So long as that I feel that I can independently and true to my conscience, I can serve the people, I will do that. Uh, there was a lot of um, controversy surrounding certain statements that you made last year uh, concerning your party policies too, uh, your current <coughs> party. So uh, where does it stand today? Um, how, how does the views of your party and the political decisions that the party and uh, those in the unity government representing your party take affect your decisions and uh, are you with them? You know this, uh, I was not bothered about that kind of things for the reason now. In 2004 when a portfolio was offered that is I did not accept. 2005 I accepted and in few months time I gave up. This was under the SLFP? That was under the SLFP. In the present government I was basically instrumental in forming the government in so many ways. Taking that is the common candidate to our side and being his uh, election agent and that uh, I organized all over the country and for the party also I served a lot especially when our leader had a difficult time of uh, securing his uh, leadership. I stood with him openly. I think I was the person that who was in the forefront to safeguard him at that time. Then of course when there were certain controversial issues came in that I spoke to the media before that in the cabinet also in the within the parliament. My, my stand was the same in everywhere. I did not want to you know that is the, uh, I, I, I did not want to um, uh, change my, my stance. Uh, finally of course the party wanted me to change the stance so that I refused then I was sacked. Uh, I thought the best thing is to have sacked without uh, resigning. Then they did it. Mm -hmm. After some times, of course, then again that the both the president and prime minister insisted that you have to be in the cab in the cabinet. I was quite reluctant, but when they insisted, I thought that uh, if there is opportunity to do some service to the nation, that uh, I will accept by being you know in outside only thing is that I can criticize and uh, it won't serve any purpose to the people and therefore of course the two challenging ministries I said okay. Minister I think as a former Minister of Judicial Affairs Justice and uh, Buddha Shasana uh, we'd, I'd also like to divert our conversation in that direction now presently a lot of uh, discussion and controversy surrounding the 20th amendment and uh, 
changes to the executive presidency. There are a lot of uh, calls from uh, the unity government, especially the United National Party, the JVP, to uh, abolish the executive presidency. You hold a different opinion. Of course. In fact, that when this constitution was enacted as far back in 1978, they are Javadana then president with a uh, lot of experience and matured politician. He intended to have uh, stable governments. Unless you form a stable government, that's all the other activities will get disrupted. Mm -hmm. The economic development will be hampered. And so many repercussions will be there when the government is not stable. And therefore, the, he's, he introduced this method somewhat similar to that of the Gaulle system. The Gaulle system means that the Charles de Gaulle mm -hmm. in France uh, enacted the constitution of similar nature. In fact, that we followed it. There are a lot of similarities. Uh, the two important factors introduced through this one was that the executive presidency, uh, instead of the cabinet exercising the executive powers, that the major power is uh, revolve upon uh, the one person right. elected by the people. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that uh, instead of the post pass, the post electoral election system, he replaced the PR system, uh, people's re that uh, proportional representative system. Mm -hmm. During that period, of course, that we also had a uh, lot of concerns about it, because too much of power and it can, you know, reach to a uh, level of a dictator. Right. The power tends to corrupt. That absolute power is absolutely corrupt. Mm -hmm. Uh, Baron Acton <laughs> said so not by me right. and that is the you know that's the eternal truth in the world the power is always like that therefore there has to be power balance and we also my I also had idea that uh, it was uh, uh, too powerful for one person to hold that much of power but uh, you cannot forget the fact that uh, in the meantime that there were a lot of constitutional changes uh, the main change uh, was the establishment of provincial councils. Right. The establishment of the provincial council was aimed not to have divisions within the territorial jurisdiction of our uh, Sri Lanka. But at the same time that when the, the provincial council established they also had lot of powers, that powers had been devolved upon the provincial councils. And therefore, when there are nine provincial councils for any emergency or, or in maybe in some unexpected uh, moment or even at organize uh, the group of people may okay. try to, you know, that uh, uh, change the shape of the state. For that kind of thing that there has to be somebody who can wield the powers. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that the, we need somebody that will say that the, the chief of the executive, that is the president, must have some power. Right. But with all that, we identified still that the president was having too much of power. Therefore, that we categorically said in our manifestos uh, in the last presidential election, uh, which was held on 8th of January 2015, the excess powers vested in the president uh, will be pruned. Mm -hmm. And also that we categorically said that whatever the powers which can be removed by having two-third votes in the parliament, but without having the approval from a referendum. Right. That is how we drafted the 19th amendment. The 19th amendment bill was challenged in the Supreme Court. There were two, three, two to three powers uh, which were to be removed from the president, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. You can, provided that you will get the approval from a re referendum. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we knew that it was not possible for us to go to a referendum and there was no such a necessity also for right. us. Then, whatever the possible powers were taken away from the president and devolved on the constitutional council, which was created under the 19th amendment, some powers to the independent commissions mm -hmm. and some powers to the uh, 
cabinet, I think now there is a power balance. And the executive presidency, not a full full powers as it was at the initial stage, but still that there are a lot of executive powers with the president. We need to maintain it because the removal of that executive powers from the president, he being a person who had been elected by the people, that there is a danger uh, with regard to the unitary states. And therefore, it is not advisable uh, as a country, as a nation. I think that this uh, 20th amendment is a uh, absurd move. So, are you of the view that this sh the 20th amen amendment should rightfully be uh, defeated in part? I can guarantee that it will never become a, you know, the reality, because that the constitutional making uh, in, in our history we know how to be handled. And especially that this 20th amendment had been moved by the JVP while having six uh, seats in the parliament. And uh, So, the UNP has no uh, blessing to this, is it? No. UN UNP has no blessing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we talk about uh, an ideal constitution going forward, I would like to ask you this, especially because uh, not, not as uh, a member of uh, the ruling party, but uh, as somebody who has uh, a thorough knowledge in uh, legal affairs and the judiciary, what do we need really to do right now? In fact, that there were certain areas where that we wanted to have some reforms with regard to the you know that um, the public administration, then good governance, accountability. But all of a sudden when the especially that uh, some of the leaders of the Tamil party started claiming making the various claims and uh, really that the, the people in the south were uh, shaken mm -hmm. and they, they they got a fear the way that uh, they were con uh, conducting especially the chief minister Vigneshwaran and some other um, extremists. Then of course that the Sinhalese people in the not only the Sinhalese even the Muslims and those who are living in the other parts of the country that they have a fear. With this fear monger that uh, it is impossible for us to go for any, any radical reforms uh, in the parliament. Uh, especially that if you have to have a new constitution, we will have to get the two third in the parliament. Now, there is no such a situation prevailing in the parliament mm -hmm. that at atmosphere is not uh, favorable at, uh, at all. The secondly that you will have to go for a referendum, uh, it is a myth. It is, n it is not possible to get the approval from the people for uh, that kind of constitution. So, which means within the next two years, we are not actually going to see any uh, changes to our constitution. I am, cons I am, I am 100 percent, you know, that uh, uh, convinced that it is, it is only a dream. It will never become a reality within that two years period. Uh, I'd like to go to talk about uh, extremism and. Um, religious violence. We saw some unfortunate incidents in Kandy and uh, this also, uh, let's also link it to uh, the northern and eastern, the national question. I think um, the northern politicians have also voiced their requirement to win their rights. Uh, recently MP Sumantiran was also uh, mentioning this week that they, they have the support of the international community to win their rights through a federal um, system. But what does it really mean, Minister, in terms of um, uh, providing a meaningful solution to these matters, uh, especially as we uh, saw some unfortunate incidents in the recent past. And uh, I think you're also a member of the select committee uh, to make recommendations on ensuring communal and ethnic harmony. You know that Scandi one was an unfortunate thing. It was not due to, you know, any lapses or weakness of our legal system. Mm -hmm. It was a failure on the part of the, uh, the really called police. Uh, there could have been enough opportunities to take some precautions. Anyway, there had been some lapses that was something somewhat unfortunate. But with regard to that, the devolution of power that they are calling as federal, some people are calling that we need the power and we need uh, power devolve uh, within a unitary state, we do not want to have a federal. The biggest problem in the northern, northern and eastern provinces is that they themselves do not know what they need and there is no unity and there is a big competition among themselves. Even the TNA, 
brought uh, 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 Chief Minister Vigneswaran who had been a uh, retired the Supreme Court judge believing that they will be able to have some intellectual dialogue and to have some kind of a solution through the through the legislature. But uh, now what has happened is that they, they themselves are fighting against each other. Uh, they are having different different you know that is the political opinions. Uh, with that scenario I do not think that there will be any consensus. But as a government, whoever rules the country, whatever the government, that they are, they are duty, government is duty bound uh, to maintain the law and order and also uh, that there are a lot of areas that the uh, attention of the urgent attention of the government should be drawn. There are housing problems, that they have development problems, they have their land problems, the unemployment and really those are the matters. Uh, we have to uh, look at from an angle of uh, humanity and attend to those issues. Mm -hmm. mm, what I see is at present in the northern, uh, especially in the northern province that the politicians are fighting among themselves, not no much concern about the people. And there is a drug menace that is everywhere, it is uh, you know that uh, spreading the mm -hmm. people are you know addicted to uh, marijuana that is ganja and uh, liquor and the younger uh, generation you know the up to various uh, the violence and those Tamil politicians are not concerned about those matters. They say that we need power, we need power. If we talk about the drug menace uh, Dr. Rajapaksa <coughs> as, as uh, you mentioned about it just now I think this is affecting not only the northern province, uh, this has also affected the south, the central and eastern. But um, of course, the president had strong words and uh, a strong tans, a stance on this and the government too is uh, planning on uh, efforts, but we do not see uh, much work being done in this area. Is it because it is uh, concerning several other regions, parts of the uh, other countries that are linked to this? No, really that is the government has made its full efforts even during the past governments that we, are, we need not take any political advantage out of a national issue as such. No, all the governments are taking a lot of you know the precautions to uh, thwart this uh, the drug peddling. But that we must not forget the fact that this is a, a drug uh, distribution hub because we are very close to uh, Afghanistan and most of the drugs come through the Pakistan and they especially that uh, they come to the sea. That this is the you know the point where that they can have easy access to Europe, Middle East, Africa, everywhere, and therefore this uh, on the other on the other hand that there are so many uh, drugs coming from Mexico, and they come to Sri Lanka, and from Sri Lanka that it goes to various places. In fact, that the much more than the pol police also taking lot of actions even the. Uh, three poses also you know quite alert on these things. Mm -hmm. With all that you know certain percentage of the drugs distributed within the country because that in, in our country also there is a well established drug mafia and they are very powerful. Most of these people are operating from the prison mm -hmm. and uh, not only in the north as you correctly said but everywhere in the country not only in the in ordinary places even in the universities and schools, university students and school students are badly affected in uh, we know that there are some reports that even within the hostels of the universities there are a lot of uh, students who are addicted to various drugs especially uh, recently also we found that those who are addicted to ganja. Right. Should not this be uh, the national question at the moment, the problem that should need be given urgent attention? In fact that this is the most combustible you know issue, burning issue in the country for the time being. Uh, in fact that instead of that our fighting among ourselves on various political issues, the attention of the whole country must you know that to be drawn to this issue. Otherwise that this will end, end up by destroying the nation. Uh, this is the danger we are living in uh, you know we are skating on thin ice. Right and also if I may go back to talk a little about the uh, the uh, 
communal and ethnic harmony, the committee that you're uh, representing, uh, I think uh, they're also expecting recommendations and certain recommendations in terms of legal um, or laws that should be brought into uh, the country. What do you think we need to do um, in terms of judicial matters? No, in terms of the judiciary is concerned that uh, the litigation matter, there is no issue uh, in the northern and eastern province that they conduct all the litigations, the court cases in uh, Tamil language. Right. Of course, that the English also being used as link language. Uh, what I feel is uh, much more than the legal reforms, we have to have some uh, humane practical approach. With regard to the legal reforms, what they talk is about that the uh, abolition of the uh, prevention of terrorism act and that uh, emergency law that kind of thing those are not really the issues the issues are that there there should be some practical approach to you know enhance the lifestyle of those people and also to ensure of course that there are nine independent uh, commissions the police judici judiciary uh, then the public service, uh, the election commission that is they are conducting uh, independently that there is no any discrimination whether it is on ethnic basis or religious basis or language basis. Uh, the, as it is of course that uh, what we will have to think in terms of the practice. Mm -hmm. I would also like to go back to the increased uh, <coughs> spate of violence that is happening in the country. I think you have made some comments recently about it too. Um, there is a concerted effort needed by the police and other uh, special task forces, as you do mention. Uh, what do we do? Because in the recent years, we see that increased uh, violence, shootings in the country, as if we are leading into a state where lawlessness prevails. Yes, that these violence take place due to various uh, reasons. But one major reason is these, uh, the drugs the drug mafia and there had been several I think the large number of killings during the recent past on violence are based on you know some conflicts among themselves. Uh, therefore, it is you cannot separate this drug issue, drug menace and the violence. They are interconnected, intertwined. Uh, therefore, we will have to address on both issues together. For that of course, that we cannot expect the police alone to you know tackle uh, all these issues. Uh, the police need the support of the people. Uh, I think that if the people you know those who can provide the information, uh, then the police also will be activated then you know do a better job. Uh, this the violence and uh, the inhuman acts of ragging that takes place at state universities. Uh, if we talk about that, I think the president too made a very strong stance recently and you have been highlighting this in the recent past uh, with so many uh, students leaving state universities uh, within uh, probably 2016-17 only, uh, close to a thousand students had left the universities just because of these violent and inhuman activities taking place. But this is not something that just happened last year exactly the 1989 students have left and there are so that uh, the number of students that who did not want to come to the university with while having all the uh, qualifications are much bigger. Of course, that the using of the term the ragging was a wrong terminology. Uh, if, if it is a ragging it is so we, we, we need not uh, bother too much because ragging is you know uh, I think that you are not aware sometimes back that was when you went into the university you know it was an entertainment and you I will be asked to sing a song uh, perform a dance and one way it is good but there is no ragging now. Now the what is there in the universities are violence and uh, sexual harassment. The biggest one is the sexual harassments, both male and female students. And there had been the 14 deaths reported during last few years. And the uh, those who left the uh, universities due to at least 90 percent was due to uh, ragging. 
and the way that they are you know harassing the students it's very difficult to explain because unless somebody's mind is abnormal you can't do that kind of things and the way that the girls have been treated that they have you are there they have taken the um, nude photos and they are threatening that they will release to the internet unless that they obey the orders given by these student leaders. They send the students with the, the cate okay. just to you know collect the money and they drop in you know various cities and they collect the money in the evening, the, they remove the seal and put all the monies together and first that they take the notes okay. and then with the coins they take the students. Uh, who beg those, you know, that's the money to the canteen and they will just give a meal. But few days later that uh, those student leaders come in, you know, brand new motorcycles with bracelets and the gold chain. And that uh, poor students that they are suffering. Uh, in the first year that they are not allowed to enter into the uh, library, they can't get into the gym. And unless they obey the orders given by those uh, student lead, so called student leaders, you know that they can't enter into the canteen. In some of the universities even in the third year they do the ragging, the ragging means that they, uh, up, they resort to violence. It is very pathetic, you know this, uh, all, most of the vice chancellors and deans are trying to you know curb this menace, but there are some teachers also, some deans also who are encouraging it. Now that is they were you know demonstrating more than two years mm -hmm. on the CITEM issue, the tri CITEM is now resolved. As a result, what happened? Because I didn't resolve the CITEM issue just because of demonstration, I would never thought about it. Uh, I resolved it because I wanted to do justice for those students in the CITEM. CITEM. They also our, our you know, children. And Sri I think Lankan. they have spent uh, lot millions of money, of money yeah. their parents' money. That's right. And, uh, they are not disqualified people, they are qualified, but that since limited opportunities are available in the medical faculty, that they did not get it. But then some of the parents by selling their, you know, residential property or whatever, that send the children uh, to study uh, due to the faults of various other parties, but certainly not on the, not a fault of the children. Then uh, we, we wanted to do some justice and we did it. As a result, what has happened that uh, they demonstrated, now all the medical students have you know, they delayed their examination for one year. You know, the losing of one year during mm -hmm. the university period. So, can you uh, that uh, account for it? You can calculate the loss. Then, the, all the other medical students who should have entered the last year had been delayed for another one year. Shouldn't drastic measures be taken by a government in order to stop <coughs> these? Because it seems that uh, students have taken. Uh, the control. Control of everything and also when you talk about some inhuman activities, it is a lot of physical harm that they uh, inflict on these students and some of these students, their parents confess that they have been very nice children but then this university system has changed them or entering university has completely changed them and now um, they, they are psychologically damaged because of either harm caused to them, inflicted upon them or because they are people who impose these on others. Yeah, what they do is that uh, when the, the student enrollment list is released, they go and check the students who come from the lowest strata of the society, economically very poor and they are the people they select as leaders and then they take them into their places and they, they do the brainwashing. After that all these children are changed, that parents also say we can't understand. One of the mother was telling that so after few days, a few days after entering into the university, there had been some the, the devil that too, as you know, uh, what do you call it, the yaka gahala, yaka vahila. Uh, that the devil, you know, that like a devil that she is conducting, she can't believe uh, what has happened. That is what they do, the brainwashing. As a result, that when they, you know, enter into the university, they see everybody as enemies. That the vice chancellor, deans, lecturers. And if somebody comes in a, with a, you know, that is a go, good, nice passion and a, a, you know, that is a good style, mm -hmm. then uh, if somebody comes in a vehicle, 
they have a lot of hatred that kind of uh, against that kind of person. And I think certain uh, university deans and vice chancellors and chancellors have been uh, subjected to house arrest or, uh, you know, they have been kept for more than 23, 24 yes. hours at times. Yeah. But uh, th in a country like Sri Lanka where we uh, are very proud about our culture and uh, how much we have so much of policies and practices, can these things happen? Uh, I, I stress upon the fact because you're the higher education yeah. minister now and I believe you would be taking uh, a lot of measures within this time, this uh, important in this important role given to you to bring some measures to really curtail uh, what's going on. That you can't be proud about that the our university culture, because that you cannot find any other country where these kind of heinous crimes are being committed within the university yeah. among the students themselves. You mean? When I went to other countries, I checked on the students, they don't know what ragging means. Even recently, I went to that uh, Dili. When I asked from the, the students of the Dili, they asked him, what is that? They don't know because I didn't want to tell them also because, uh, you know, they it's a germ. I yeah. didn't want to, you know, take the germ to now the New Dili from Sri Lanka. It is very pathetic. But one thing I admire, uh, this, you know, the pathetic situation, uh, you know, that the had foreseen by uh, former minister, minister of education, uh, late uh, Richard Patiran. He knew this situation. He expected, you know, this thing can happen in the future. As far back in 1998, 20 years ago, that he introduced that uh, law, mm -hmm. uh, ragging and other form of violence in the high educational institutions. Uh, what happened was that law was enacted. That was a perfect law. Uh, it was not implemented. Mm -hmm. There has not been more, more, more than one or two cases filed under that. When uh, there are serious, you know, that um, violence, sexual harassments, uh, if some complaint comes, of course, very rarely a complaint comes because if you make a complaint that that particular student knows that thereafter he won't be able to, you know, continue his studies in that university. He will have to give up. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they have reluctant. Because even if you make a complaint to the police or to the university authority, they knew nothing will happen. Right. That is why that they didn't complain. Now, of course, now we have given the assurance to the students. During the recent past, we have got more than 480 complaints. Mm -hmm. An action taken? Yes. If case by case that we are taking actions, and for the first time that we are implementing this uh, ragging act. Uh, earlier, the police just filed papers under the criminal procedure code, and they were just produce and bail out. Under the ragging act, the magistrate has no power to grant bail. Mm -hmm. They will have to apply to the high court. It is a matter of, you know, at least three to four months. And secondly, that if somebody is convicted under that act, uh, the magistrate is empowered to, you know, uh, impose a sentence running up to uh, 10 years, right. a very deterrent punishment. Now, we have implemented, we have given instructions to the police whenever there is uh, any any violence or incident which comes within the purview of that law you must file case under the ragging act mm -hmm. and i think at the moment there are more than 40 uh, 40 students behind the bars right. including five buddhist monks in the runa university uh, we will not hesitate to take uh, legal action against anybody who fail to maintain the discipline within the university they are teachers, deans, all are contributory factor that they have not taken uh, proper, you know, that uh, initiatives when these things were reported. Uh, on the other hand, that they were also, you know, that uh, uh, they couldn't do many things because that the police was inactive or there had been sometimes political pressure. Now, there is nothing like that. They have, we have strengthened all the university councils. And we have given the confidence to all the vice chancellors, deans, and the lecturers. Now, of course, that they are implementing the law. Is this a pledge, Minister, that uh, within your tenure as the higher education minister, that uh, we may see an end to this menace? I have the confidence that I'll be able to do it within the next few months' time. Right. Um, before we uh, wrap up our discussion at Hyde Park, I'd also like to uh, finally touch on CITEM. I think this matter has been discuss discussed at length, but uh, a solution was provided in terms of uh, absorbing uh, 
the students enrolled to CITEM, the medical faculty to the Sir John Kotalavala um, University. But um, if I may move on to talk a little about regulating higher education, I think this issue, uh, the students had nothing to do because there was a university that offered uh, medical education and then propped up these matters about regulated education in terms of medical um, science. But uh, what measures should be taken right now? Really that this item issue also has cropped up as a result of our, you know, the lacuna in law. In every country, especially when there are, you know, that, uh, uh, that uh, education system, high education system uh, by the state as well as by the private sector that there are regulatory methods and we did not have that kind of regulatory method. If we had a system like that, I think that we could have easily avoided, you know, that uh, issues, burning issues like um, in uh, CITA. Now we have already drafted that the cabinet has given the approval uh, to establish an independent commission for the quality assurance and accreditation. Mm -hmm. Once that independent commission is established, I expect to, you know, that hope to uh, ten, submit it to the present it to the parliament within next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Then once it is, you know, that approved that there will be an independent uh, accreditation and quality assurance commission. Mm -hmm. From the day that we are, you are going to start a university, high educational institution till the degree certificate is awarded. The every aspect of that uh, institution uh, and the event are being monitored by that independent commission. Mm -hmm. Not only in the private sector, even the government, government sector, sector, because we do not we don't draw uh, uh, the difference between them, because the quality and quality has to be maintained, whatever the you know, city respective of the ownership. Okay. And therefore, that we have already drafted that law, that is in the legal draft office. I think that uh, in the course of this month, or at least uh, early next month, I will present it to the parliament then this uh, monitoring part and also the assurance of the quality can be maintained in our education system. Which means uh, all uh, higher education institutes, uh, private institutes will also come under the purview of this commission? If all, all the higher education uh, institutions, there are 15 universities which are governed by the uh, university grant commission. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, there are four other state universities including uh, the Kotalawala right. Defense uh, University and two Bikku universities and that is Ocean University. Yes. In addition to that in the private sector there are 19 higher educational institutions which confer degree certificates. Mm -hmm. Then all will be monitored in the similar way and also we wanted to you know that uh, ensure the quality of the graduates not only in, in this you know the reputed universities like Peradeniya, Kalambu, Jadhanapura, even in the other remote areas in universities also that uh, to bring up to the same standard. Is there space for private medical education in Sri Lanka? At the moment that there is no any restriction, uh, especially that the people opposed to the CITEM not because that they were against the private medical education. That was the stance Standards. taken up by the uh, GM also, Government Medical Officers Association. They were worried about the standard, not only they, even we are worried about but that. But couldn't those standards be introduced uh, through uh, examinations, government examinations? No, government examinations that you have the standard you have to maintain in the government, there are eight medical faculties. Mm -hmm. This is with regard to the private uh, medical if faculties. If we, if we, uh, if we had a law, if we had a law to maintain to assure the standards mm -hmm. like that I we, we are already drafted if we had a law at that time then nobody could have a question about the standard because the standard are being monitored that maintained is, the, is there any sort of uh, after idea? that we after that this uh, bill is you know that the pass in the parliament uh, that is if uh, they may some parties can you know apply and if they give the guarantee that they will maintain the status the standard and also that the commission can monitor at any time in length. Mm -hmm. I think there will be a possibility and I do not think that in that event there is anybody will have a uh, concern about the or fear about uh, private medical schools. Right. Again, before we wrap up, um, I would <coughs> like to uh, 
talk about the University Grants Commission. This is pertaining to uh, the uh, link that was made about uh, the central bank bond issuance, the controversial, the scam. Um, and uh, there is to, uh, it is said that one billion rupees worth of funds were, uh, there was a loss. And uh, if we talk about that, you said le legal measures will be taken to recover these losses. What is the progress of it? My recollection is that was about uh, 840 million investment. Okay. After following the tender procedure, the money had been invested on the treasury bills through the NSB, National Savings Bank, which is a primary dealer. And once you go and deposit your money in a bank, you have no right to ask that that particular money he had been given on a loan or whether they have given it to a drug dealer or what kind of investment they have made. That is like that uh, UGC also invested their money that is in the state bank and also at that time I checked that the market interest rate had been 9.6 but they have invested at 10 percent. Mm -hmm. After the maturity of the bonds, the entire amount had come to the university grant commission there is no loss in that investment. Mm -hmm. But when this the bond commission was appointed, it had been revealed the money that we invested in the national savings bank on the treasury bonds, you know that the NSB had got involved uh, with uh, this uh, perpetual treasury company and there had been a deal in between the national savings bank and uh, this particular uh, controversial company. And that company had made use of those bonds uh, and they have really abused uh, uh, abuse their powers and enter into various transactions with third parties. Mm -hmm. By doing so that they have earned you know that is uh, the money which could not have been you know earned in a, in a, in a legal manner. Therefore, that the uh, bond commission has given some directions to the central bank. Central bank has made a calculation in which that they had disclosed by abusing their authorities, by misusing the bonds, mm -hmm. that particular company had earned some uh, additional amount of money, which is you know that there is a legal principle which is called unjust enrichment. Right. And they have been unjustly enriched mm -hmm. with a particular amount. Okay. And therefore, the central bank says that you, you must recover that from the, uh, that particular company. As a result that the attorney general is the government. Uh, it is this profit that was made that is deemed as a loss to uh, not loss to us. Okay. We have not lost a single cent. It was not an investment which was made during my period. That Previously. was during my, my predecessor's period. Mm -hmm. In fact, that we being the ministers, we do not interview and we did not know. But when this problem cropped up, then we looked into everything right. and there was no loss on the transaction, not a single cent was lost. But they have abused the authority and misused the bonds and earn some illegal money which the central bank says which should come to the state. state. Then the attorney general being the chief legal advisor to the state, they we instructed the attorney general to file action. He filed it in fact that the media persons also came to know uh, because that uh, we filed the case. It's now, now the process of recovering these. Yeah, uh, the attorney right. general is continuing with the case. Okay. But I it is what I want to explain is it is not a loss to the uh, the UGC in terms of the contract. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, Dr. Vijaydasa Rajapaksa, thank you very much for your time here. I think we were able to talk a lot about uh, your political career and also your views on uh, some important matters concerning the people and uh, the country. Thank you very much for your time and I wish you all the very best in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. We had with us uh, Minister of Higher Education and Cultural Affairs, former Minister of Justice and Buddha Shasana, Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksa joining us at Hyde Park tonight. We'll see you again next Thursday at the same time. Until then, take care.